When you saw me interview the guys who make this light app, which is a big data app, they built it on top of Cassandra. And I'm hearing that more and more from startups. That's part of one of five trends I'm seeing as part of the age of context that I keep talking about. Uh, you know, more and more sensors, more and more wearable computing, big data and social, social networks that keep evolving and mapping that keeps evolving. All that stuff is happening to make us able to build really personal new systems. And today we're gonna to talk to uh, DataStax about how they're helping the big data world. Who are you? Billy Bosworth, CEO of a company called DataStax. I've been around databases for a very long time. First 10 years of my career was a developer in the DBA, uh, write a, writing a lot of turnkey systems for departmental level companies. And um, met these guys through when I was at Quest Software, who just got acquired by Dell recently. And we partnered with a lot of companies in this space, and I was very interested in what this change was going to look like for the database world. Yeah. In particular, what was it going to mean to the traditional DBA, the world that I came from, and the traditional database developer? I've always had a big interest in that. So it's been a fascinating ride. I joined the company last May, so I've been here about a year and a half, and it's been a great time. So I, I'm seeing these five trends, you know, whether it be wearable computing sensors is going uh, exponentially more and more sensors every year, or maturing social networks that we can do stuff with, study what your Facebook is or your Twitter tweets are. Right. I mean, there's companies like Vintank that just study when the world talks about wine, and that happens 1.1 million times a day right now, and it's going up. Right. So all these new things are happening. Uh, General Electric calls it the inter industrial internet. They're studying, uh, they're putting sensors on turbines to study if they mm -hmm. need to be repaired, and that goes into a database, and you right. businesses a lot of data. What are you seeing happening in this world? Context is king, no doubt about it, because understanding not just your customer from a very superficial sense, but getting a deep understanding of their trends, their patterns, their likes, their dislikes, their relationships, that's everything. And what we're seeing is as the next generation of apps are built, they're truly transforming how companies are attacking their markets, whether it's going after entirely new markets or new problems that they were never able to solve before. They're doing something that's really transforming how they used to think and do business. That's been a big mind shift for people like us who came out of the relational world that we have to change our paradigm on how we think. Yeah. And we used to write for departments, as I told you in the intro. Then we started writing for companies, but then we started writing for countries, and then we started writing for the planet. And so trying to understand how to grow your app through that kind of scale and keep context is a daunting task, but that's exactly what's happening in the world of big data applications. When you, when you started your career, you, you, know, you had to buy a mainframe somewhere, right? <laughs> and put uh, some software on there and, and pay a company a lot of money for that. Now the world is a lot bigger, a lot faster. I mean, 1.1 million Twitter conversations about wine a day is different than even five or six years ago, yeah. right? I would probably describe it like this. When, if you came to me five years ago and said, hey Billy, let's go write an app for restaurant reservations, I would start thinking in my mind, because I came out just when Oracle was coming on the rise, like 92 is when I yeah. came out of school. And so I've been conditioned to think about that app in a certain way. So I would say, okay, Robert, great. Here's what we're gonna do. Uh, in my mind, I've got some ideas on the data model on how everything's going to be stored, and I'd say, let's find the openings, let's find people who come in, let's find the openings, put them in the slot, great, we're done. Today's world, we have to think about that totally different. You'd have to come in and we'd have to say, okay, Robert, here's what we need to understand. Somebody might be walking by our restaurant, or they might be two miles of our restaurant. They might be having transit problems. Maybe there's a backup in traffic and they're not going to get to where they needed to be. Is it raining? Maybe they like to stop in. Do they have kids? We have a great opening at seven o'clock, you know, for a special on kids meals, and we're a family friendly restaurant. Maybe we should let that person know that as they're walking by our restaurant. And maybe we should give them movie tickets for afterwards because we know they like this kind of movie, and the movie theater's two blocks away. That's how you now have to think about yeah. an application. And every app we now build, every app has to have that kind of context about a person, or else it's going to be left behind very quickly. And no, that's even, why I say transformative apps. Even Toys, Toy Talk is a new company, they just got $16 million. Uh, was started by the ex-CTO of Pixar, and the toy itself, the, the yeah. iPad, is going to know what the weather is, and they're going to make yep. an API call out to weather.com or something and know that it's raining outside, and they're going to change the 
behavior of that toy. Even toys are changing because of this Absolutely. Stuff. So Absolutely. What, what does this mean a real business? <laughs> if, yeah, if toys so, are, Mattel thinks of themselves as real business, but most of us are studying, I don't know, oil field right, results or exactly. you know, sales from a retail store or something like that. Exactly, and we do see it everywhere. We see these problems, and these problems kind of manifest themselves around one of the biggest pain points where we play in, with our technology is this notion of continuous availability. We have become a very spoiled culture, right. and we have become a very demanding culture. Think about your own experiences. If you go to get on a site or an app, then you have to wait two seconds, you get frustrated. You start to bail, you start to look for other alternatives. So this idea of an app being continuously available is a paradigm shift. This is not how we used to think before. We might have one backup server or a very small cluster. But again, now we're at country scale. Yeah. Now we're at global scale. How do I ensure that that's gonna be continuously available all around the world? Multiple data centers is now the norm for these architectures. So businesses have to make sure, A, that they're going to be there and available. B, it better be fast. It has to scream. So when that application is talking directly to the device or to the customer, it has to be able to operate in a way that they're not gonna lose that, that customer loyalty very quickly, right? Yeah. So all those problems create this other challenge of operational simplicity and then cost. You can't let this stuff get out of control either. Every business that we work with is fighting with that and we range from Fortune 100 businesses, we range from household names like Adobe or Netflix, down to startups who are just trying to solve a brand new problem in a new way, but they have that same common use case of continuously available, extremely high performance, low operational cost to keep my overall cost down. So Cassandra, you're built on Cassandra and what, what other technologies are underneath your uh, covers? So what we do initially, we take Cassandra's beautiful architecture, which is something called fully distributed which basically just means that you can access it from anywhere. Every node's the same. Yeah. If, you, if you lose a machine, you don't feel it. It, it go, goes on about its merry way. So you can have a thousand servers, yes. and if four of them disappear because of a power outage or something, you don't see that the system doesn't go down. Continuous availability. Yeah. And this is something you'll hear Netflix talk about a lot. Even though Netflix does so much in the cloud, being in a high availability zone in the cloud is not enough. They actually spread it across availability regions in the cloud to make sure if they take a hit, like with Sandy, or a power storm, or, or an outage of some other type, that they can still carry on, even if you lose an entire data center. So think about just not losing a couple machines. What if you lose a data center? Yeah. How do you avoid that disaster? That's kind of the challenges that they're looking at today. We have customers now building on top of Amazon and Rackspace Cloud to make sure that if Amazon goes away, Rackspace is still there, or yep. if Rackspace goes away, Amazon's still there, right? And I highly recommend that, actually. We've got a big retailer we're working with at the moment that's got a co-located physical data center, so they've got uh, the same database now spread across two physical data centers, but then it's also spread across, across two cloud environments, and it's the same database in all of those worlds. And anybody from anywhere can hit it from any place. So if you lose one of them, it doesn't go down. So that's our first use case. Yeah. We take that great distributed architecture, then we say, you're probably also gonna wanna do some searching. You're probably also gonna wanna do some analytics. So we take two very popular open source technologies called Apache Solar yeah. and Apache Hadoop and we bring those on top of the Cassandra architecture, truly integrated, not just loosely connected, truly integrated, so that a uh, line of business, when they're thinking about writing one of these transformative apps, has everything they need for their silo to build that app. Then they may take the data and they might pipe it over to their Hadoop data warehouse or something like that. But for us, we tend to live with that line of business app. Does this work only on cloud or can you host it internally on your own data centers? No, or? absolutely internally and that's key to what we do. We want to be agnostic to the underlying uh, destination decision and that's critical actually to what we do because we don't want to limit architects in saying this is a cloud only solution or worse, only that cloud, which I think is the worst scenario. Yeah. We want to be able to say you can spread this across your physical data centers you can spread it across your cloud data centers or any combination there. Well, we, at Rackspace, we love that because we, we uh, gifted the world OpenStack, right? Did. That's an open source technology now. And you can run that internally, externally Absolutely. on our servers, on competitor servers or yes. whatnot. And so it gives you a lot of choice. But a lot of businesses need sometimes the control. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a pharmaceutical company, you might not be able to host on a public cloud. You might have to right. uh, host that data internally on government your government agencies. We see it as well. Same thing. Yeah, yeah, same thing there. But you hit on it. It's the flexibility of being able to take those baby steps. For example, let's say you're a traditional business and you're starting off and you would say, I want to control it. Maybe just philosophically, you can't get over it. 
well, okay, fine. Start in your data center. But wouldn't it be nice if maybe if you took a couple pieces of it and started pushing it off to a cloud just to test? You can do that with our technology. That's the beauty of that fully distributed architecture is you can take baby steps into the cloud. You can take baby steps into multiple clouds. Yeah. Or you can go all in from day one if you choose to. It really doesn't matter how you go about doing it. So Cassandra was developed partly at Facebook and Solar was partly developed for Yahoo, right? Um, they've had their own hardcore geeks to yeah. manage. But we're talking to a lot of businesses around the world who don't have a, a, D, a hardcore DBA. How how geeky is this, and can I can I do it just without knowing too much, or what do I need to learn? Who do I need to bring on board to help me uh, build one of these big data systems? Yeah, great question. It, 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 at essence, that's why we exist. We want to make this technology consumable and accessible by businesses, and what we say by mere mortals. Yeah. Sometimes when you talk about the crowd at Google and Facebook at Yahoo, it's still eye-popping what they do. They do so much customization, they do so much of their own tweaking, they're brilliant. The average company is not in that business, so yeah. they have to find a way to consume this technology in a way that enables their teams to move very, very quickly. They don't want to get behind in the administration side of things. So what we've done as a company is bring all this stuff together and package it in a way where you can be up and running in minutes. And we have demos on if you want to get started very quickly, we can get a cluster up on Amazon, for example, and I think it was under three minutes or four minutes to get a 10 node cluster up and running. Mm -hmm. If you want to do it on premise, you can do it on a couple of machines. If you want to virtualize it on one box, you, you can, can do it on Rackspace Cloud. You can do it on Rackspace Cloud. We have people doing it there as well. Yeah. And we have a our job is to make it easy to get up and running and get started because one of the knocks on our technology in the early days was it's, it's what I call three standard deviation guys. These are guys that are way, way at the end of the bell curve and we're bringing that back into the masses because we do solve technical challenging problems. I, I do want to say when people choose Cassandra, one of our customers, um, uh, Meta Broadcast, we just did an interview with them and they said, uh, we don't choose Cassandra for simple problems. Yeah. These are complex problems where we need amazing performance, so and we yeah. have to balance that with ease of use. If we sat down and I said, Robert, tell me about your app you're trying to build. Okay. And, he, and we start talking about it and I said, okay, what happens if that goes down? And you came back to me and said, well, as long as I'm up in five minutes, nothing really, not a, bit, not a big thing. Probably not in the best conversation, but if you tell me, no, 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 that's the whole point. I don't want this thing ever to go down. My users have to know that they're going to be able to get it and get it fast when they need it. Got it. Now we're in a good conversation. As an example, big data, right? The but can't MySQL do that? Can't uh, other database technologies? So I'm getting to that, right? Okay. So big data, people tend to think, uh, if you're not immersed in it, you tend to think volume. Yeah right, thousands of or millions of something or other, right? In our world, sometimes we have customers who do fairly small implementations, but they gotta spread it. They gotta have it across data centers. They gotta have some of it in the cloud. They gotta have some of it in multiple clouds. That gets awfully difficult, if not impossible, with relational technology. It's why I made a career change, because I saw this modern transformative app requiring this availability in new architectural ways relational databases just weren't designed to handle. They just weren't. They still have their use cases. And the second part that I would answer to that is, it's not an either or. We have to get over that. So many people want to know, if you're using this, it means you're not using that. Right. Modern architectures today, you'd be amazed how many back-end data stores are in place. The, the Adobe example I gave you with their audience manager product, they've got a big Hadoop data warehouse that they use. They even use HBase as part of that, which is another kind of the real-time accessible technologies. But for the piece that touches the users, that has to be available all the time, has to be lightning fast, got to be spread across geos, that's Cassandra. Same app, same general app. Yeah. And you see that on the back end a lot of times and it's brokered by services. So the really smart application architects figure out which APIs go to which data store. But it's very confusing, unfortunately, to the person who's trying to learn about this because they'll say, wait a minute, you, you're talking about you're in that company. I heard such and such was in that company. Yep. It might actually be the same app but it's done on the back end in different ways. So we have to get out of this mentality of either or and understand that it's a multiplicity of back end data stores used for the right scenarios. Our scenario, continuous availability, very fast performance, never down across clouds, across data centers, that kind of thing. When I first visit data stacks, what would I see? What, how do I manage that? And how is that different from other approaches? We have uh, one thing was required. Now, I told you my first 10 years were developer DBA. Then after that, I went to work for tools companies. And tools are really valuable as you're trying to get into the beat of the bell curve. 
And what we've done is create a product and interface called OpCenter that manages not only the Cassandra bit, but also the integration of the Hadoop and the solar so that you get a very simple point and click web interface yeah. that gives you nice pretty pictures and gives you your alerts and your warnings, allows you to do provisioning and things like that. So that's sort of the window to the product is our product called OpCenter. Without that, the ease of use gets much, much harder. And that's why it's important for us to continue to deliver not just the better integration of the technologies, but what's the face? How do I operate with it? How do I integrate with it? That's what that's what OpCenter does. If I'm building something for, let's say, the, the next Olympics or the next, I don't know, big big app, how do I do? I test it. Do I use like um, Sosta to test that? And and do you have any uh, ability to show what what would happen to the system when there's a load applied to it? Yeah, great great question. This is where cloud providers come in really handy because sometimes it's much easier to spin up your load tests in the cloud than it is to do on your own data center. So step one, it becomes easy to do your own testing. Step two, and this is the beauty of open source, there's a lot of published results out there. Some of it are from customers, like you saw with Netflix, where they did a test, they needed to do a scalability test to see not if it would scale, but how it would scale. What's it gonna look like on a performance curve? And that's where we come up with this linear scalability. It actually is a straight line, which is a good thing. We've also got some academic research papers that have been done where they benchmarked a lot of these things at scale against each other to help people understand what's the right use case. And then finally, we're actually going to be releasing some independent benchmarks that we've commissioned. We should have those by January to help people understand what's this going to look like at scale? Because you hit on a great point. It's easy to get started sometimes. Yep. One of the bigger problems is people will get started with a couple of nodes and think, I got it. And then all of a sudden, when it gets to 50 nodes, 100 nodes, 200 nodes, it's oops. Maybe I didn't choose the right technology. It goes back to that operational simplicity problem. If you lose that at scale, you lose everything. You lose performance, you lose your cost benefits. You don't want to be in that situation. Yeah. Can I monitor the world uh, as, I, as I turn on my system and see where I, I need new nodes or new, uh, uh, where I need to maybe open a, a new regional data center or a, open up new cloud capabilities? Is there a way yeah. to see that system in real time? That's OpCenter. So OpCenter gives you that window into the product where you can start to watch the load. You can start to watch which nodes are getting hit heavily and maybe it's time to expand. One of the other challenges for a paradigm shift for a lot of the relational people, we were taught for so many years to scale up. And as the, the Moore's Law continues and the hardware gets more powerful, we're tempted sometimes to think, throw more at that node, just make that node bigger. And in reality, it's all about distributing that load. And that's what we did in an unnatural way with this thing called sharding yeah. in the MySQL world, which was a very unnatural way to do it. We forced a relational with database. Memcached D and stuff. Yeah, that was a more elegant Memcached. solution for the non-persisted layer, for the in-memory layer, but for the relational layer, it was painful when we tried to make that happen. It just wasn't built for that. So in our world, you solve those problems through more distribution with more nodes. And where you put the nodes with our solution doesn't really matter. Very cool. We have to end up, but it, we could talk for hours yeah. about this. And I bet you, each customer is going to have their own needs, right? Uh, you know, if you're a Procter and Gamble, you need something different than Walmart needs and Union Pacific needs, right? Well, use case. So really, again, if it's about the use case, I would say that uh, it's hard to imagine a company today who doesn't have, and I'll use the horrible term, big data. But it is hard to imagine a company that's not dealing with some of these challenges of context and more information. Who doesn't want more data? Like, what, what are you comfortable as a business person saying, I don't need to know that about my customer? Yeah. Are you willing to let any of that go? I don't care what you do. I don't care how traditional your business is. So the next challenge is then, okay, now let's architect the app in the way where we're taking the right tool for the right job and we're putting it in place through a set of APIs to make it screen. That's what we're seeing today. Very cool. Where do we learn more about you? Datastacks.com. You can come out. We got a lot of information, a lot of free information, white papers, videos, all that sort of thing. Very cool. Thanks for coming in. Talk to me about the age of context. Thank you. Love it.